uh, getting your foam concentrate tested. So that's why we're going to test it. Now let's move on to what tests are done during the periodic testing. You'll notice that it said uh, foam quality condition testing. Well, what's, what do we define as foam quality? Well, in NFPA, there is no formal definition. So in Chapter 3 of every NFPA standard is a section on definitions. There's no foam quality specifically defined, unfortunately. Um, but it is inferred in a lot of the annex. They talk about foam quality. They have annexes on, on tests, and they talk about expansion and drain time. But I'll point you to UL162. This is an example of a listing standard. So when you have a foam product, and, and it's going to be listed. Uh, UL is just one example, but let's say it is UL, list this product. They're going to use UL162. It's a document, uh, has a variety of tests in it. They're going to use that to, as the basis for listing this product, to put it through the ringer, if you will, and see if it's going to work. In that document, they define foam quality as a measure of foam characteristics expressed as 25% drain time and expansion value. So drain time and expansion value. So those are really what we're, the main thing when we're talking about foam quality. And we'll get into other tests. I'm not saying that's all there is. But when we talk about foam quality, typically we're talking about expansion and drain time. So what's expansion? Well, what's shown on screen here uh, is kind of an example of, of a test setup, if you will. And there are different ones and different standards. Um, but generally, in most cases, you're going to make your solution at the concentration it's listed at or, or being used at. So if I got a 3% foam, we're going to mix up 3% foam. You're, you're going to provide me the concentrate. We'll use our water unless you provided your water, if your water is, is not municipal, uh, typical water. We're going to mix it up at 3% if that's the case, or 1% if it's 1% foam. We're going to put it through this test equipment, this test nozzle. It's going to hit against the backboard, and we're going to collect it. And what we're seeing is, okay, I started with a liquid, and now I've obviously aerated it. I've got uh, air trapped in it, it's expanded, right? So it's filled a larger volume. So that's our expansion ratio. Um, it's essentially the, the ratio of the, of the final volume versus how much solution it took to fill that, right? If I took a one milliliter and I shook it up, and now it takes up a space of maybe five milliliters, well, that's a five to one expansion, right? So that's, that's what we're talking about, expansion ratio. Obviously, that's very important with foam, because why do we use foam, right? We have class B fires, we have liquids. If I were to just spray water on one, it's going to splash it everywhere. But two, water is more dense than, than these Class B, these liquid fires and these gasolines. It's just going to settle on the bottom. So a flammable fuel is going to remain on top. It's going to stay on fire. So we need something, one, that's, that's going to be lighter than the fuel. It's going to sit on top of it and smother it. And that's where foam comes in. We take the solution. We pull it full of air so now it's less dense. And it can sit on top of the, the fuel, the, the hazard. So expansion ratio, very important. And then 25% drain time, or, or drain time in general. So again, I talked about how important it is to have a foam blanket sit on top of that fuel, and we're going to smother it. We're going to cut it off from oxygen, maybe cool it. Some of these have some cooling mechanisms. Well, it does me no good if, if I'm fighting a fire to my left, and I get that foam blanket covering it, great, start putting it out, and now I, you know it's a kind of a larger fire. I turn to my right. By the time I turn, the stuff on the left has dissolved, has disappeared. Right? So we do need it to last a certain amount of time, a certain uh, drainage rate, a drainage time. And, and, and that is what we're talking about when we're talking about drainage time. And that's actually the, the picture on the right here. Um, there you can see the foam blanket on top. Uh, and this is kind of just a crude example. But you can see, so these are bubbles, but as they start to dissolve, as they start to pop, the solution is still there. The solution isn't disappearing. I've just taken my solution and expanded it with air. Well, as that water disappears and the solution goes back down, um, and, and in this case it's dense, so it sits on the bottom. So we're going to measure how long it takes in this case of 25% drain time. Just a common um, um, benchmark is what we set for low expansion foams. How long does it take for 25% of that solution to get back into, into solution form from that foam blanket? So again, I take my crude example. I have a milliliter. I shook it up, and now it takes up five milliliters. That's a five to one expansion. I'm going to sit and I'm going to watch it. And 25% of that one milliliter, how long does it take for that to get back to the bottom? I'm not going to wait for all of it. Why don't we just do drainage time for the whole foam blanket to drain back down to the solution? Well, that would just take too long. So that's why we said it. Typically, uh, when we're discussing low expansion, 25. High expansion foams, um, we test those too, and that, that certainly um, comes into play here. But those, we typically talk in terms of a 50% drain time. Why is that? Again, it's just kind of the industry standard. Um, 
the high expansion foam drain a little bit quicker so we can give them that 50, we can wait for 50% of it to get back in solution. But what tests are done during the periodic foam quality uh, check? I mean, these are really the big ones, expansion drain time. You can do that on every, every foam concentrate coming through here. But there are certainly other tests we're gonna do as well, all right? And uh, I won't do them in the order shown on screen, I'm just gonna kind of talk about them. We talked about uh, uh, expansion and drain time. Those are really, again, we're performance-wise, foam quality, really important. There's a third one that I will put up there just as important, which is the film formation or spreading coefficient. So if I have a film forming foam, so that could be an AFFF, and that includes your alcohol resistant AFFFs, so that's your aqueous film forming foam. These could be protein film forming floral proteins as well, so triple uh, FPs. We got a lot of triple Fs in this industry. Anything that says it's film forming, that's a foam that has a, a extra layer of protection, if you will. And that's shown on screen. I'm going to highlight it with my arrow. Let's just say, and this is a very crude example. This is from an old 3M video. Uh, they took a dollop of foam and just kind of splashed it on a plate. Uh, there is a, we, we do utilize a, a little bit um, more analytical test uh, for the film formation for one, and then we also do the spreading coefficient. But just a crude example, throw a dollop of foam on there, and you notice, so we got our fuel on the left, but there's this, this almost translucent layer coming off that dollop of foam. What is that? Well, that, that, that's the film right there. That's a little bit of fluorochemical and water solution that's sitting between the foam blanket and the fuel. I have an extra layer of this, this, this film. And why is this film, why do we do this? One, I mean, who doesn't want more protection, right? And where this really comes important is, let's say the foam blanket gets separated. Let's say I step in it or something, or my hose drags across it and sweeps some of the foam blanket to the side. Well, hopefully the foam kind of flows back over it and covers it, but maybe not so quick. But the film, the film's gonna be very quick. If I step and I lift my foot up and my foam has been spread across, well, the, the, the fluorochemical and solution that is slowly drained, we talked about drainage, but that's actually gonna sit on top too and form that extra layer of protection and it's gonna seal right back over that. So it made it for a, for a very good foam, um, the, these film forming foams, obviously under some scrutiny. So to get, to get this film, you need a very low surface tension or a very um, positive spreading coefficient. Um, and to achieve that, unfortunately, you do need fluorochemicals, at least to date. I'm not aware of any hydrocarbon or hydro, uh, you know, any uh, non-fluorochemical based surfactants that'll achieve a low enough surface tension to get a film. So unfortunately, this does mean, this does rule out our synthetics, our S triple Fs, our, uh, not our synthetics, but our fluorine free synthetics aren't gonna be forming a film. But this is an important thing to check, right? You've paid, you've bought, a, a film forming foam, you have this added layer of protection. It's very important, just like expansion and drain time, that we check the film formation. Can it still form a film? There are a couple ways to do that. Again, we can take a petri dish, we can put cyclohexane. Now, you hear me talk about cyclohexane a lot, that's just defined. That comes right from NFPA, that's in IMO, that's in a lot of the standards. Uh, it's just a very, it, it's just a fuel we've kind of all standardized across. A lot of people ask, why not use gas? Uh, That'd be great, right? That's a very common uh, hazard, but gas varies throughout the world, time of the year. It's just not very um, uniform throughout the year, and, and not every lab's gonna get the same results. So that's where cyclohexane comes in. But we can take a petri dish to cyclohexane and we can put some foam solution on it and see if we can see, again, this translucent film, and even light a match over it. And there's some videos on our website of this as well, and see if it forms a film. Um, and that's kind of a more of a crude test, and we can do it. If it forms a film, that certainly is a, a, a film forming foam. Um, but how it's defined analytically, quantitatively, is what I call a spreading coefficient. We're actually going to measure the surface tension, and that's the picture on the bottom here. That liquid there, and you can see it's clinging onto that ring. So that ring has got some liquid, let's say some water on it. Water has a very high surface tension. If you've ever put a drop of water on the table or something, it forms a sphere. That's because it's really attracted to itself. Think of surface tension like that. How how attracted to itself is it? You know, some flu some liquids will flow when they have surfactants, especially, and they will they will wet the surface, they'll cover it. It's like a wetting agent, right? But water by itself, just pure water, really strong, really attracted to itself. It's going to form a sphere. But anyways, the ring has been wetted in the picture I'm showing on screen, and you saw the water being pulled when you pull the ring through it. It's hanging on for dear life. It wants to stay there, and that that force 
of it hanging on to each other, that's the surface tension. And we want to try to counteract that so these, these, these foams are wet and these, certain, these, these bubbles will form. We reduce the surface tension. So we're actually going to check the spreading coefficient is just a theoretical equation where I take the surface tension of, of the fuel I'm going to sit on minus the surface tension of the, the, the foam solution I have, again, at the percent it's supposed to be used at, minus the interfacial tension of the two, and I get a number. That number just needs to be positive. That's all it is. is if it's positive, it means, yep, it, it, theoretically it'll form a film. Negative, no, it won't. Um, so that, again, <clears throat> that's addressing one of the other tests we do, and I brought that up right after expansion and drain time because I will put that up there just like expansion and drain time for a film-forming foam. I want to see that positive spreading coefficient on that. And a, a foam sample that comes to our lab, that even if it has a great expansion and it takes a while to drain, um, but it doesn't form a film and it says it's supposed to, it's listed as an AFFF, it's still going to fail. It's supposed to be an AFFF. It's supposed to have that added layer that extra layer of protection, it does not. So that's up there with what I call performance properties, things that will pass, fail uh, a sample. Um, along, with, along the same lines, we'll actually jump to uh, physical properties now. These things uh, are just kind of more uh, attributes of the foam, how it's looking right now versus how it was. None of these physical properties that we check are necessarily going to fail foam. There are a few um, extenuating circumstances. There are a few times where it will, and I'll mention those. Uh, but these are just kind of a, a look in, a peek into how's the foam doing compared to how it was. And the main ones usually checked are, are refractive index, density, or some people um, like to express it as specific gravity, viscosity, and pH. And I'll note of those, the viscosity is not going to be on, on every foam, at least not here at Dyne. And AFFF, very thin, right? You shake it, it's almost like water. Uh, for the viscosities we're measuring with the spindle we're measuring, it's going to register zero almost every time or very low. So we typically don't report that. We don't even test it. But AFFF, anything that's thick, we're going to give you a viscosity of it. So let's run through each of these real quick. So I talked about, again, expansion, uh, drain time. Again, we got that test nozzle, the backboard. I talked about spreading coefficient. We're going to use a tensiometer and a pull a ring through, and we're going to measure the force on that. All these physical properties, what I like to call plug and chug. You're going to have an instrument, typically a benchtop unit, at least here in the lab. Some of these, uh, there are, are uh, field versions of them, uh, portable versions, but and it's just going to be an instrument where we just put the, some of your sample on, we're going to hit go, and the instrument's going to spit out a number. And that's how refractive index is. So refractive index, um, I'm not going to get too technical, but essentially shine the light through the sample, and based on what's in there, the light will refract a certain amount. So refractive index is, is just a good property of, okay, it had this refractive when it was made, and now it has this. And we'll talk about later why it might change, but that's refractive instance, refractive in index. Uh, a lot of you may already know density. It's obviously just how much mass in a certain volume. You can certainly have a cup of a specific volume and put a sample in there and measure how, uh, how much mass it has. But there are more efficient ways these days, and we use a density meter. Again, it's just an instrument pull the sample up into it, and it tells me what the density is. Um, pH, same thing, it's just a probe, uh, maybe you remember using it, if you haven't used one in the field, maybe back in high school, probably use pHs. There's, we don't use pH strips, those aren't probably accurate enough for us, but similar concept, but we're going to use a probe, it's going to give us the pH, and that's going to tell us how much, um, essentially how much hydronium atom there is, but how acidic or basic something is. So seven being neutral when we're talking about pH, Anything less than seven is acidic. Anything greater than seven is basic. And last but not least is viscosity, is how thick something is. Uh, we use a spindle, so it's an instrument that has a spindle that just rotates. And it measures as it rotates in your sample, so we put your sample and we put the spindle in, measures how much resistance to that rotation there is, and that gives us a number. That's how we talk about viscosity. So these are all our, the physical properties we'll give you. Again, we just really compare them. If something looks off, that doesn't mean it's going to fail. We're going to still look to the performance, the expansion drain time film formation, and see whether or not um, it's still acceptable. If it does still perform, but something was off physically, so maybe that uh, maybe it isn't what you thought it was, or maybe there has been something that's occurred, but it's not enough to make it fail. Let's say uh, there is something that fails. Then we usually go back to those physical properties and look at when you ask, because typically we'll get the question, we say, hey, this is no longer acceptable. It has a poor expansion value, for example. 
we'll look back and we'll look at those physical properties to try to say why. Well, oh, let's look look at the refractive and density. They're very low. They're like water. Oh, maybe it was diluted. So that's how these physical properties come in. But when you send it to a lab, what are you getting tested? You're getting tested for from quality expansion drain time. And again, I'm going to throw the third one up there, that film formation, that spreading coefficient, if it's a film forming foam. And then you're also usually getting the, these physical properties, again, to, to compare them year after year. There are a couple um, other tests you see on screen, mainly the sediment, burn back, and acetone. For our customers uh, familiar with IMO, again, the International Maritime Organization Standards, you're probably very familiar with these. For NFPA, you're probably not. Uh, it's just something required by IMO for specifically for protein foams on the burn back and acetone. Um, but the sediment uh, is required on all IMO samples. It's something you guys can request if you're doing NFPA standards. It's not required, but it's something you can request us, uh, have, us have us do. Um, so the sediment is actually the one sample shown on screen. We'll take uh, 100 uh, milliliters of sample, put it in a centrifuge. So uh, as many of you may know, as you centrifuge something, when you spin it really fast, all the more massive particles will settle toward the bottom. That's how we separate out all the sediment, the stuff that's not in solution. Then we can quantify that. We can give it a percentage. Uh, and IMO has a requirement that it be uh, less than a certain amount. Again, NFPA doesn't say you have to check this every year, but um, it's something we can do if you're interested. So they burn back and acetone stability, what are these? These are almost, um, I, I, we don't really get requests for them unless they're required. They're required by IMO, again, only for specifically alcohol-resistant protein-based foam. So both of these tests are alcohol-resistant tests, if you will. Let's start with the acetone stability. That's like it sounds. I'm literally just gonna take some acetone. Again, I'm gonna make up a, a foam blanket of a, of the, at the listed, at the nominal percent. And I'm going to put it on top of the acetone. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to see, does it dissolve really quickly? Because a non-AR foam on acetone, which is a polar, which is a, a polar solvent, it'll just dissolve it instantly. So that's one way they want you to, to verify. So alcohol-resistant proteins, why, why those specifically? Well, the, there was a track record um, for some time where there was a lot of foams out there that were listed as alcohol-resistant protein-based foams that really weren't performing very well on polar solvents, on alcohols. So that's where IMO stepped in and said, hold on, I'm going to add an extra test on the periodical basis. I want you to check the, the burn back and, and, and or the, a small scale fire test and then the acetone stability. So acetone stability, that's like just like again what it sounds, acetone, foam blanket, see if it dissolves. The burn back time is a little bit more involved where we're going to use, in this case, we're going to use IPA, another polar solvent. But um, what we're going to do in this case is not only we're we going to apply the foam blanket, but we're going to actually start a fire in the middle and then expose the foam to the fire and see if it'll actually put it back out. So we're not doing an extinguishment. I'm not applying it to extinguish it. I'm actually applying the foam, restarting the fire, and then seeing if it'll put it back out. Again, this is a very small scale version of, of what's done at UL-162. So at UL-162, certainly when you have it listed, not on a periodical basis, but when you have it listed, you're gonna do a full scale fire test. So almost, uh, I think it's almost 50 square feet. Um, you're gonna extinguish the fire, then what they do is they put a stove pipe, this big pan in the middle, they scoop out some of the foam and they re reignite it in the middle, pull out that stove pipe and see if it can put it back out. This is what we call a burn back. So we do have the ability to do a very small scale version of that uh, as well. So these are the tests you might see conducted. Again, um, just a brief overview of them. So we do these tests and we get these results to you and what do they, what do they mean? Well, what are the requirements? Well, what does NFPA say? Again, we're going to look at the, the standards. All they say is when a foam type or brand is known, you should compare those results uh, to what the manufacturer specifications are. And on screen is an example. This is an Ansel data sheet. It looks like for their 3x3 low viscosity product, uh, alcohol resistant AFFF. And some of those parameters we talked about you can see on screen uh, are there. So they give you kind of the, the typical properties you can expect. So we're going to compare it to that when the product or brand is known. If it's not known, it doesn't say you can't do it. Um, it's just, you're, you're almost gonna be shooting yourself in the foot. You're gonna be getting probably the most strict um, standard, right? So if we don't know what it is, we gotta assume the worst, and okay, it needs to have a certain level of performance. Uh, so it's always best, always best, if you know, you get us the product, if you know it, get us that information so we can make the correct comparison. But again, if you, if you really don't know, you can still send it to us. We will still get you results. And we have some minimum benchmarks that we're comfortable saying, yep, this is, this is acceptable. Um, in that case, we actually look to other standards, like the mil spec has a 
5.0 expansion across the board minimum. Um, we allow a 10% degradation from that for field, but um, if you know what it is, make sure you get that information to us so we can make this comparison. So that's what we're gonna do with the results. Once we have all these results, we're gonna make a comparison to the manufactured specified properties, hopefully. Hopefully you know what you have. All right, so <clears throat> putting it all together, how do I interpret all this? So I kind of briefly went through why do we do it? Again, we want to ensure continued performance and we do it because it's required. Annually, NFPA and 11 and 25 right now say I have to test it. What tests do we do? Well, for sure we're doing expansion and drain time. That's foam quality when we talk about it. We're also gonna do film formation for anything film forming foam and then there's a variety of physical properties we're gonna check. So you get this report on screen is just an example of a, of a report. I, I, I think it's, yeah, totally, it's just, uh, it's nobody specific sample of these results and, you know, I just typed something in to, to demonstrate it to you. And this is what it may look like to you. So appearance is, is just, uh, you know, like it says, it's just info only, just for your own knowledge. Obviously, if you have a protein foam and it's supposed to be dark brown and you have something that's blue, that should indicate to you that you probably don't have what you thought. Let's look at some of the, the physical properties, so density and viscosity. Let's start with let's start with density. Here this product's supposed to have this range. The product value I have, 1.112, shows in that range. So it, it meets the spec, right? It's it's similar to what it was when it was made, or at least what the manufacturer, when they're making a product, they've said they have this range, it falls within that range. Great. What if it doesn't? That's kind of what this slide here, what I'm gonna talk about, what if it doesn't? So why would it be low? Let's say it's less than 1.04 in this case. Well, if it's less than 1.04, really what that probably means is I've probably had some dilution, some water get into it. So water density is around one. Uh, if you're dealing with seawater, it's like well, 1.02, uh, just so you know. And just because you do it with seawater doesn't mean it's gonna go all the way down to one. But that, that's probably my first uh, inclination is if it's less than that, it's probably diluted with the water or it's contaminated with something else. So I probably put a different foam in it, let's say, maybe even a compatible foam, but let's, let's say I've topped it off at one point. Well, did you top it off with the same product, same lot even? So that's typically when we talk about low, we're looking to see, okay, it's probably diluted. Um, what if it's high? Uh, high, very unlikely, it could be some contamination, uh, maybe some, something used maybe to install it or some chemical they thought were putting in it. I don't know, there could be some sort of contamination, but typically when it's high, to me, that's suggesting from what I've seen, it's usually just the product, a different product than what they thought. Maybe they have records saying this is in there, but somewhere along the years, someone came in and put something else or topped it off with something else. Usually high is a different product. So we can't add water and go higher. We can only add water and dilute and it'll go lower because the density of water is only one. So that's typically high or low. So if it is out of spec, let's say it is out of spec, is that a problem? Well, again, no, as long as it still performs. But if it doesn't perform, that's gonna to be to me a good indicator. Why doesn't it perform? Well, hey, this, this density is out of spec. And the same thing goes, it's not shown on here. This is a protein foam. We don't typically do refractive. It looks like a, uh, protein foams, but same thing, the exact same thing applies with refractive index. Um, typical refractive index, 1.35, 1.36, uh, but 1.33 is water. So if I have a 1.36 foam and I add water, I'm gonna drop that down. What if, what if my refractive index is high? Again, great indicator. It's probably not the product you think it is. All right, so viscosity shown on screen. Again, um, especially for alcohol resistant foams, those are the ones that are gonna have this thickness to them. And why are they thick? So why is an AFFF thin and, and a alcohol resistant thick? It's an ingredient they add in the alcohol resistant foam to make it alcohol resistant. The thick polymer ingredient they add to it. And that's what actually protects it when it's on top of an alcohol, that polymer is designed to fall out of solution, sit on top of that alcohol, kind of like the film, sits on top of it and protects that foam blanket. So that polymer, that nice protection against alcohols is also what gives us our thickness. So it's important for one, obviously, uh, again, we're not talking about it today, but the acceptance test, the flow test, different thickness foam will flow through the equipment differently. You know, that could impact your proportioning. But as a product, right, let's say, again, I talked about how important that polymer ingredient is to protect against alcohols. Let's say it has, a, in this case, a 3,000 viscosity. Well, if it dropped to 1,500, that means there's less polymer, right? I, maybe I cut it in half, the amount of polymer. So if I have less polymer, I have less protection against alcohols. So notice this isn't to say the thicker the foam, 
the better, the more protection, right? No, it's it's all based upon how it's designed. And this foam is designed to have 3,000. So if it's less than that, it's a problem. We certainly have low viscosity products that are designed to have the same level of protection with a lower viscosity, maybe 2,000 or 1,000. So it all, with all of these results, it's always going back, reflecting upon, well, how was it designed? So there are different designs, there are different applications. You can't ever just compare side by side these physical properties, um, product to product. You want to compare the same product to how it was designed, again, to its manufacturer specification. So let's get into why if viscosity is low. Again, water, <laughs> you'll notice a trend here. Uh, dilution is very important here. Uh, if it's low, again, water doesn't have a thickness to it. So I take something with 3,000, I put water in, I'm going to drive down that thickness. But there's another one with viscosity. I haven't mentioned with the other ones, but um, why would viscosity be low? Polymer ingredient, unfortunately, can separate out of solution. A uh, common example of this is if I have a foam concentrate that is frozen. Now, that's not necessarily bad by itself. It, once it unthaws, you should be fine, but you might have to stir it back up. You'll look at the manufacturer recommendation. Let's say you try to recirculate it. And why is that? Because sometimes when that happens, the polymer ingredient can actually kind of separate out of solution. So I might end up with, yeah, it's a really thin foam now. Well, the polymer is somewhere, but it's probably sank to the bottom, or if it happens to be lighter, it's sitting on top. It usually sink to the bottom. And then... You know, now you got a problem, right? Now, if the foam is proportioning from the top, well, the first foam coming out is not going to have that polymer. It's not going to protect against alcohol. Then you got a real big problem once you get down into where the polymer is separated. That's just going to clog everything up, right? So you want to recirculate that. Usually, it'll get back in solution. Uh, if you're ever concerned, recirculate it and then send it to us to have us check or, or for sure monitor it closely for the next uh, few months to make sure it doesn't separate back out. Um, but polymer separation can happen for other reasons. A big one, uh, again, freezing and thawing, if you're in an area that doesn't have that. Another big one to look out for is mixing of incompatible products. So if I take an ARA triple S and a protein foam, for example, and for some reason I, I mix them in the same tank, I didn't realize it, and I put the wrong product in. Well, different products, like I said, are designed differently, and they have different chemistries. So if I mix incompatible products, uh, I could have reactions occur in environments that ingredients don't like, and they separate out. So that's something we look about too when, when we have viscosity low. Okay, did I dilute it? If not, was it freezing and thawing? Or have we mixed some products and we have gotten a, a polymer separation? Of course, just like if it's high, I haven't talked about high yet, but if it's high, it's, again, we're probably looking at something that's a different product, just like low. The other instance when it's high is it could be I baked my foam. I've got an environment, let's say above 120 is typical storage max, 120 Fahrenheit. You get above that, you start baking off some of the solvents and leaving behind. I've even seen almost like a Vaseline consistency where it's just sticky and thick, and yeah, you've just baked it. So that's something we look at when viscosity is high. And the last, in this case, performance property, but a lot of times in NFDA it'll be called a physical property. Again, it's just in this case, we must have done this report to IMO. IMO requires the pH be between 6 and 9.5, and it will fail if it's not between those properties. So again, how acidic or basic something is. Luckily, most of these foams, the way they're designed, are fairly neutral, right? 7 being neutral, it's great. Uh, we want to try to stay there. The industry standard, generally we're talking foam, 6 to 9.5. With IMO, if you're outside those ranges, your product fails. And if it doesn't fail, but again, it's something to keep an eye on. All right, why, why would it be low? Well, again, we could have water dilution, diluting it, not only the water being acidic. Usually, you know, if I get rusty water, it's probably like 5, um, a pH of 5. That could have been the case. Um, not only that, but even if I mix it with nice, clean, neutral water, say 7 water, well, now I've diluted the buffers, so a chemical that's kind of designed to keep the pH stable. I've diluted them in solution, and now they're not going to work as effectively. Um, age can certainly be with the pH uh, condition. There are surfactants surf, uh, in this product, right? And as chemicals break down, they produce byproducts and, and little side reactions and things like that. We, you know, age can certainly be an uh, indicator of the pH can shift it either way, low or high. And it really depends on the surfactant they use. You know, do I have something when it breaks down that's going to form acidic byproducts? Or, you know, do I have a sulfate group and as it breaks, it's going to form sulfuric acid? Or um, do I have something more basic that when it breaks down, it's going to drive it the other way? But that's what we're looking at, looking at pH, just like the other properties. These, uh, like I ran through, 
are good indicators of what's going on with the foam. And when I give you a report and you ask me, why does it fail? Why does it look like this? This is kind of the mental gymnastics we're running through. We're looking at these results. Why could it be low? Why could it be high? Do multiple of these line up with each other? Do they not? Those are the physical properties. Now, when it comes to performance properties, it's very easy on you. Either it meets it, and the report will say it has to be in this range, and if it's not, then it fails. So that, that those are very straightforward. Again, sediment, what's shown on screen, this is the maximum from IMO not required in, in NFPA, but IMO, you have to be below a certain percentage. Why would it be lower? Well, you never don't have to worry about it being too low, but why would it be high? Well, you just you got some crud in the system. Um, maybe some things are, are corroding, maybe the tank, the trim pipe. So that's, a, that's something I'll mention right now is make sure when you're taking these samples, everything I do and what I put on this report is only as good as the sample you give me, right? So if I have some rusty trim pipe and it's got all these little flakes of metal in it and I'm just going to quickly open it up, grab my little sample and send it to the lab, well, you're probably going to get a pretty bad result, right? Because your sample you're saying is representative of your, let's say you got a thousand gallon system, well, you just took about an inch off that trim pipe and, you know, a bunch of crud in it. That's not really representative of what's in the bladder, right? So we really want to make sure in that case, if I'm taking it off some length of trim pipe, try to drain that out, get 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 into the good stuff, get into the, the tank itself um, and get that sample. We want something to be representative of the tank, you know, not necessarily what's sitting in that trim pipe. Um, uh, sediment, sediment dispersion, after we do it, we take those little chunks of sediment and we see, well, how big are they? And that's another thing I want you to check. We've already touched expansion and drain time. Again, this is going to be product specific. Uh, expansion ratio, we can briefly touch on why would it be low. Again, dilution, you'll hear me say that a lot. Age is a big thing. Again, these foams aren't designed to last forever. Um, some of them last a long time, especially some of the old ones that are chock full of, of C8, so the chock full of PFAS. Uh, obviously, that PFAS, man-made molecule, is designed to last, and it does last very well, but that's why we're in the problem we're in now with PFAS. Um, so age, storage, storage conditions are very important for all these performance properties. You hear me say that a lot, especially heat and direct sunlight, you know, the UV or the heat, that can provide energy for reactions to occur, things to break down, things to bake off. Um, so that's why it could be low. Again, why would an expansion ratio be high? Generally, it's not going higher. So you start with a product, it's only ever going to get worse and worse. This, you know, I'm, I'm not aware of a product that <laughs> starts to improve as it sits on the field. Um, Briefly, that reminds me of viscosity. There is sometimes with the viscosity, you will see that one go up within the first year. So you test it, and the next year all of a sudden it went up, and then it's stable. What happens there is what I've been told is they make the product, they send it out the door, and that polymer ingredient can kind of hydrate, can kind of absorb water, but it takes a little bit, right? So when they when they test it and right out the door, if we give us a sample, it's 2,000, then the next year it's three, and then it stays at three the rest of the time. What happened there is the polymer just fully hydrated. As it was sitting in there that year, it fully had a chance to absorb all that water. So that's the only instance that I can think of right now where something's going to increase if it sits, sits out in the field. Uh, drain time, again, why is it low? Again, dilution, age, storage condition, things breaking down, uh, either contaminated or, again, we've had reactions occur, and that can be accelerated by storage conditions. Film formation, again, this we provide info only. This is similar to a dollop you saw. We do it a little bit more technical where we apply a certain amount of the solution itself on top of screw on a surface area, um, and then we light a match and see how long, is it, how long does it take one. It took 30 seconds, it says, for this one to form the film, and then we pass a match over. Does this film seal, and we see will that match ignite or not? And obviously, if it formed a film, it won't ignite. But if it didn't form a film, that extra layer of protection, it would ignite. And then obviously the, the spreading coefficient I talked about earlier, that test, it just needs to be greater than or less than zero. Typically you'll see a specific number there uh, if we have to actually go about measuring. If it passes the film formation test, it, it's definitely positive. Uh, the ones on the edge we're actually going to take and do that spreading coefficient test. Why would a spreading coefficient be negative? Or again, why would it fail? Again, dilution age, storage condition, very important. Uh, another big one is, was well, it actually a film-forming foam? We've had a lot of foams where people people just, they, they assume AFFF just means foam, and they just call everything AFFF, but that's not the case, especially nowadays. Obviously, we have had protein for many years, but now we have SFFF, synthetic fluorine-free foams. So another FFF, but in this case, not standing for film formation. Um, so we got to be careful here when we're naming things. Naming is very important. Again, 
what you give me is very important and then what you tell me it's supposed to be is very important to what I compare it to. So um, again, if, it, if we'll get stuff a lot of times and boy, it has a very high surface tension, relatively speaking, for an AFFF, uh, we'll always tell you, double check once you get your report, double check, make sure we got it entered, how it's supposed to be, how what you have in the field. And then again, the, the burn back, uh, acetone stability. So again, these are alcohol resistance tests, only required on IMO. You won't see them on NFPA unless you've requested them as an in addition. Why would something fail that? You know, here it again, age, storage condition, uh, dilution, or it's not alcohol resistant or it's lost some of its alcohol resistant uh, power, if you will. Maybe it's polymers low. So this would be a good situation where I look and if it failed one of these alcohol resistant tests, First thing I do is I look at the viscosity and see, well, does it still have all that polymer it's supposed to? Um, so yeah, that's kind of the general overview. There's obviously some other info we can give you. We can give you how diluted it is and things like that. Your overall result is always presented at the bottom, at least at Dyne. So we go and we look your overall result. If there are any fails, overall we would recommend replacement or investigation depending on what the situation is. Um, You'll see in-spec, out-of-spec, that's on your physical properties. So again, if I say something's out-of-spec, that doesn't mean it fails. We're gonna look at the performance properties down here to see if we're failing it. So these are just kind of clues to what's going on. Down here is the actual performance. So that was, again, a brief overview of why we do it. We've gotta check, make sure things are still working. We gotta do it because code says so. What tests do we do? Expansion drain time are very important. Um, especially if there's no film. If we got an SFFF, the expansion becomes really our only protection. So very important. And then there's some other tests we can do. And then what do we compare them to? We compare them to what the manufacturer spec is uh, when available. If not, we have to look to kind of a, a basic benchmark, which is only going to be a hindrance to you. You know, um, so we have this basic benchmark, and we've had some products come in and say, nope, I've got a listing. I've I've proven it works down here. Okay, great, then we can go down there. But unless we're told it's that product, we're not willing to go to that level. So we make that comparison and then we briefly went through a report and how do I kind of, those mental gymnastics of how do I interpret this? If it's just simply pass fail, it'll say an overall result for you. It'll say whether or not we recommend replacement. You can always call us and ask us, hey, why does this fail? And look, you know, any of the technicians here, they're all very well uh, experienced and skilled in looking at these results. And they're gonna do kind of like what I ran through, look at each of those physical properties and try to put the clues together, put the puzzle together and see what could this mean. You know, okay, if I have, again, if I have poor performance, uh, poor drain time or, or poor alcohol resistant performance, that's the viscosity, that's that polymer ingredient. Or if I see my refractive and density, there everything's low across the board. Looks very, it's approaching water. All these specs look like water. Well, that might explain why the performance looks like water. So that's kind of what we're, we're doing when we interpret the result. So we'll open up to questions. Uh, went a little long. I think I said I was only going to go a half hour, but I get a little long winded talking about this. But um, we'll open it up to questions now. I'll still be around for another 15 minutes here if, if need be. So um, there's a couple questions coming through yeah. the chat. What is the typical turnaround time on testing? Yeah, turnaround time here at Dyne. Uh, we guarantee in five business days. We can do it uh, rush. That's an added fee though, but we can do it within 24 or 36 hours. Why do I say that? Well, NFPA, I can get it done in 24. I can do it in a day. I can't do an IMO sample that marine organization in a day because they want me to condition it in an oven for 24 hours before I test it, kind of to age it an extra year. So IMO, NFPA is taking a snapshot right now. What does the sample look like? IMO actually ages it in an oven at 60 degrees for 24 hours. They're taking a snapshot of what it looks like it's a simulated aging a year from now. Um, that's kind of the difference. So I can't do an IMO next day because it has to sit in an oven for 24 hours. But five days guaranteed is just the standard when you ask for pricing and things like that. You'll see standard and rush. Um, we can get it done uh, pretty quickly. There's another question coming in. Um, somebody asked if it would be recorded, and yes, there will be a link to the recording. I'll send out a follow-up email within the next day or so with a link to that. Um, what are the requirements for samples? I've seen samples taken from the bottom of the tank and the top. Ah, as far as sampling goes, there is no requirement in NFPA. For antifreeze, they give you, right? They give you very specific locations. They don't on foam. So I get, I mean, that, that 
ultimately it's up to you. It's up to the well, it's up to the building owner, and if you're their designated representative, it's up to you. Um, I will say the larger the tank is, I guess the more um, beneficial it is to take a top and bottom. So especially large tank, these aren't homogeneous. These aren't the same throughout. Especially if I've been topping the tank off from time to time, it can be very important we take a top and bottom. Um, uh, so obviously a small, smaller tank, less likely to have such large differences, but I've definitely seen where these thousands of gallons of tanks, yeah, the bottom is quite a bit different than the top, mostly because of the topping off issue. You can have some, the way foam degrades, the top be a little bit different um, than the bottom. Uh, I'll mention on the top, be very careful with atmospheric tanks, stationary ones that, that aren't moving around. On those tanks specifically, they sometimes put mineral oil, um, just, you know, the mineral oil you can go buy at the store, but they probably have specific stuff for you. But the mineral oil is designed to prevent evaporation. So again, I said atmospheric, so they're not sealed in a bladder. They, they, they are exposed to the elements. We don't want that solvent that's in there. So foam, if I take foam, it's like 80% of it's actually just water. And then, you know, 15% of it's the solvent. What, you know, and then we have like the 5% of it's like our surfactants and floral surfactants and things like that. Or polymer ingredient might be in there. But anyways, the solvent, we don't, we just don't want, we want to prevent evaporation. They'll put mineral oil. And the reason I bring this up when you do a top sample is mineral oil is not foam. It's not going to expand like foam. And we've actually found even small amounts has a, very, has a hindrance on the performance, the drain time, the expansions. It's a problem. Um, you see a lot of manufacturers, they'll have technical bullets, bulletins on this as well. Make sure that mineral oil stays on top. Again, I said stationary tanks because we don't want to slosh this stuff around once the mineral oil is on it because now I'm going to ingrain that mineral oil throughout. I don't want to top it off because now my mineral oil layer that was on top is now going to be in the middle. I don't want to recirculate it because now I've just mixed it up. Um, and when it comes to sampling when it's on top, make sure you get below it. Don't just skim off the top. Make sure to get below that layer and get, again, a representative sample of the concentrate. But as far as top, bottom, what's required, there is no requirement. Uh, it's to your own benefit. Uh, again, I would say the larger it is, the more beneficial it is to take a top and bottom. There can be some differences from the top to bottom. If you want to assure that it's uniform, um, I, I would recommend that. But it's up to you. It just says your foam concentrate has to be tested. So that even gets me, I think it was a previous year's webinar, we've done something similar, just foam concentrate testing every year. Someone had asked about, let's say I have several totes, maybe six totes, and they're all the same lot, purchased same time, sitting in the same area, can that be considered one foam concentrate? And yeah, you could consider that if you want. Um, the argument being obviously, have they really been exposed to the same? Was that one in the corner right next to a heater? Was that one in sun and the others weren't? That's where you got to be a little bit careful, but I have even seen that where um, people have the same lot, same storage, assume the same. Now, once you get into bladder tanks, really those should be their own. Each one's a sample, right? Each one's in its own isolated environment. It's bladder. We could have a leak in that bladder, things like that. But as far as top and bottom, no requirement. I would say, again, I'm not going to say you have to do anything, but it's, uh, the way I phrase it is it's just beneficial the larger the, top, the tank is, um, the more important it is to take a top and bottom. Next question? Yeah. With all the restrictions with fluorinated foam, do you guys have any recommendations on disposal? As I'm sure you guys see mass quantity all year. <clears throat> uh, we don't have any official recommendations on disposal. We have had the question a few times. Right now we do use incineration. We use a company, I think they're Clean Earth now. They used to be Stereocycle. Um, you know, reach out to your local, you know, your local EPA or reach out to your local waste companies. See what they're offering. You know, there's different, uh, he was even a guy with deep well injection that I called once that may be an option. I don't know. Um, again, we follow uh, incineration right now, there is some frowned upon upon incineration. It's not ideal. There's no really ideal way to get rid of PFAS. It's actually, I think, will be a pretty big industry coming up, finding different ways to remediate and, and, and eliminate this stuff in different ways and more environmental ways. But as far as recommendations, it's, it's really just um, reaching out to your local EPA. The regulations are all over the place right now. 
fortunately, there's not just one, you know, overarching for everyone in the states or everyone in the world. It has to be this done this way. So you really got to reach out to your local guys, see what they got going on. But um, as far as your guys' samples that we receive, uh, they we hold them for a month. So if you have any last minute changes or you, again, you get your report back and you review it, like, oh no, I I didn't have the products I thought. Well, we we hold it for a month. Uh, to give you some time to look at it and get back to us. And then after that, uh, the samples are incinerated um, for us. But it's a good question. Yeah, be very careful with these, with the lawsuits going on these days and firefighting foam being a unique application. So they say out of the PFAS made, only like 5% of it or less was actually used for foam. But it's a big problem because <laughs> foam, the way it's used, right, it's just, it's mixed with water and it's applied to the ground and Right where my my PFAS and my metal pans not so easily into the ecosystem. Um, so it's a unique application. You have to be very careful with fluorinated foams, um, making sure we're disposing of them correctly and, and capturing them. Someone else asked. I think they're asking, do you need to recycle the tank before collecting the sample? I wonder if he means recirculate. Recirculate. Probably. Possibly. Yeah. Uh, that's a loaded question. Um, if if you can, you know, if it if it's it's always best, right? I mean, let's get a representative if things have settled. But you have to be careful with that because again, I talked about like mineral oil. If there is a contaminant or, or, some, or mineral oil being a contaminant, but it's one we choose to use on top, we don't want to mix that up into it, right? Because maybe it's only on the top and we can save the rest. Um, so that's a loaded question of. Should I recirculate? There are some that would say yes. I think there are some, you know, even IMO I think might recommend it recirculating, especially for pro protein foams, especially protein foams being a bit of a different animal, um, not as homogeneous and full of some crud, if you will. <laughs> uh, but they recommend recirculation. But again, I would just err on the side of caution. It sounds like a great idea, right? Like let's really make sure it's fully uniform every year, kind of agitate it up. Just be careful. Make sure it is something. You can, because again, you don't want to take, like, like I said, an atmospheric tank with mineral oil. You don't want to mix that one up. So just be careful if that is the case. Is it required? No, it's not a requirement. Um, you could, again, do the results, uh, do the test, excuse me, and see what the results are and then go from there and go, okay, uh, if, especially if you do a top and bottom, then you would get to see, okay, there is a difference between top and bottom or my polymer has separated out a little bit, then I need to circulate. You could use the results to decide that if, if you wanted. But um, some people recommend it, some won't. I, I certainly see both cases. There are times you probably do want to, and there are times when you don't. Uh, how can the premix time, is that the one we're at? Yep. How can the premix time affect the performance parameters? Is it a good idea to store foam as a premix? Well, that's a great, that's a great question there. <laughs> so what he's asking is once I mix my foam and my water up, can I just store it as that? Obviously, there are extinguishers that are, are foam water extinguishers. And can you do that? It depends. Those foams that are being used in extinguishers are designed for that application, have been tested and proven to last, I think it's three years before they have to be replaced or tested. Um, not just any foam you should just take, and we've seen it here in the lab, where as it sits in solution again, the, the buffers and chemicals in the foam, once I dilute them with water, are no longer as effective. So it'll degrade much quicker. Um, for solution testing, if you're just checking refractive, the refractive won't change, but as far as performance will, it can degrade a little bit. So does it affect performance? Yes. I mean, if you're talking about a fixed system where it, it trips, the system trips, and I'm making my foam, and I, I it's meant to be applied right then. It's not meant to be made, stored for six months, and then applied later. I mean, uh, unless the manufacturer has done that testing and you've gotten approval for that, um, I mean, that kind of defeats the purpose of, of a concentrate, right, if you're just storing large volumes of premixed foam. Uh, but that's a great question. It does, it does affect performance in some foams, not all foams. The foams and extinguishers have been designed to last for such a time. They probably have those buffers or still effective, they've been made to be effective even in that diluted, in their 3% or 1% concentration. So can it affect? Yes, time can. Um, if you are having us check a premix performance that you're making up, make sure you get it to us 
very quickly. If you're just having us check a premix, a solution for percent concentration, that's not going to change. Our factor is not going to change, but how well it expands, how the surfactants do that, that can change. Uh, when we test foam concentrate for customers, we often get different requests, some totes, uh, some open seal. Let's see. That's a question or a comment. Yeah, it could be a comment. They're just saying that they get a lot of requests for different, we have different totes and unsealed totes and manufacturers appear to differ with respect to what needs to be tested. Yeah, the manufacturer recommendations certainly come into play and you should follow those whenever you can. Uh, NFPA is just a minimum standard, so the manufacturer can certainly go above and beyond. If NFPA says to test it once a year, but the manufacturer, maybe they have some new product and they're just doing their due diligence and they say do it twice a year, then I would, again, the NFPA just being a minimum. Now, if they're less than NFPA, I would follow NFPA. Again, that would be the minimum amount I do. Um, and it just says to check your foam concentrates uh, annually is what NFPA 11 and 25, again, they overlap right now, uh, what they say. But manufacturer, uh, all NFPA documents talk about manufacturer recommendations and they're, you know, they're certainly valid. Um, if the bladder needed to be drained for some reason, is there a safe way to capture the foam so it can be returned to the bladder tank? Yeah, the, you know, you can capture the foam and reuse it, uh, assuming in that case the bladder is not ripped, right? I, my foam is still good. You you can test it and be sure. Um, but yeah, it certainly could be. You can certainly reuse it. It's not like a sprinkler where you uninstall it and you're not allowed to reinstall it. You can reuse the foam as long as it's Still good, but again, I would say my question would be why are you draining it unless there's a problem. If there's a problem, just be careful again. If there's a problem because the bladder leaked, well, then the foam's probably shot. You know, it's probably mixed with water throughout, but um, yeah, I'm sure there could be a way you can save it. Uh, how do you do it? Again, I would just point you to the manufacturer, uh, whoever made the tank, or, you know, they're going to have what's the best, what's the easiest way, I guess, the most efficient way to get this stuff out and reuse it. How would you ship samples from overseas? Is there a recommendation filling up the sample bottles? Um, or can there still be some air? Uh, would this affect quality? So from overseas, um, so here in the States, uh, many of you that are here in the States know we provide free shipping both to you and back. Uh, the return shipping is not something included from overseas. So unfortunately, um, that's probably where this question is coming up. I mean, how, the best way to ship it is up to you. I would certainly still utilize our kits. Uh, we, we can work with overseas customers, get them bulk orders of kits. So the kits, when I say a kit, our sample kit is really just bottles for you. Clean bottles, we know they're clean, we know they seal really well, they're the amount we need, and, and it can, contains a bag, so if it leaks in transit, it's stored within the bag. Um, that's important. Um, we even sometimes recommend, if you're worried that the cap is going to fall off, you can put a little electrical tape around it, really make sure those things are sealed. Bag them, we don't want soggy boxes coming back. Um, but as far as um, how to ship it, again, just put it in a bottle, make sure it's sealed, and put it in a bag is what most shipping companies are going to want. And then the, the provider is up to you. Is there a recommendation on filling up those sample bottles? Yeah, we would like 250 mils. Can you use a 50 mil bottle and only put it half full? Yeah, you asked if there's air in there, is that going to impact it? No, I'm not. Not in the transit time. Again, you maybe you're thinking solvent evaporation, but it still should be a sealed system. Obviously, if the cap was off it, that's a problem. That's a problem whether or not it's full. Um, but we want a sealed uh, 250 milliliters uh, would be enough. I think for IMO, unless you're an IMO customer, we ask for 500. Those those extra tests I talked about, uh, we're going to need a little bit more. To, like that sediment took 100 mils. You saw it in that picture right by itself. Um, <clears throat> so we'd ask for a little bit more than that. So it's filling it from the top effect quality. No, it shouldn't as long as the bottle is sealed. And again, I'd recommend putting them in bags for those in the U.S. and even overseas. You don't have to worry about trying to find all these supplies. We have free kits. Reach out to us and get you those kits. Use those. The foam concentrate uh, generate a gas. I've seen AFFF 50 gallon tanks that seem to implode when they break down. Uh, can it generate a gas? Not to my knowledge, but it doesn't mean <laughs> that that can happen. I'm sure, I mean, again, we're dealing with chemicals. Can a reaction occur that generates O2 or CO2 and pressurizes things? Certainly. I mean, that's with dry chemical that we see issues with. So you mix different types, but I'm not readily familiar with 
uh, concentrates generating gases, no. But it's not to say it can't happen. That, that certainly could be a thing. Uh, certificates, Jenny, do you want to take that one? Do we get a yeah. certificate? How do we get a certificate for taking this webinar? If so, how do we get it? Yes, I will send out certificates to everyone that was logged on for the webinar. I usually send them out same day um, to your email address. It'll be a PDF attached to the email. Um, yeah, that should answer that one for you. I had one up here. Um, if a foam agent is tested with IPA for alcohol resistant, why use acetone? Maybe the agent has been not tested or does not have a UL listing for acetone. Yeah, that's it. Again, we got IMO specifically requires these two tests for protein alcohol resistant foams only. It's kind of been a little gripe of mine too. Why do we do both these tests? They're both measuring alcohol resistance. Let's just take the one that's a little bit harder to pass, which is probably the isopropyl alcohol, the IPA, which also involves the fire, the burn back time, the small scale fire test. Uh, just do that one. Why do they do both? I don't know. Unfortunately, uh, I don't participate in the IMO. I don't know how to participate in the IMO committees. Boy, that is a different beast. So IMO does it very well, right? Like anyone, even, even the public, anyone can submit a comment, you can attend meetings, you can see how they're changed. I'm not quite sure why they decided to uh, do both of those tests. I'm sure there's a reason. So I'm sure they, they had a reason to do it, but it's a good question. Something I've had the same thought of. Why do we do IPA and an acetone test? Why not just do one of them? But again, typically it's not uncommon for a alcohol resistant protein foam to fail the IPA, but it'll pass the acetone. And that's just because one, IPA is probably a little bit harder, a little bit harsher. And then two, I'm introducing the fire with the IPA, the small scale fire test which is a whole new variable. Now I have all that heat and evaporation and things going on. Um, so uh, there's that. Uh, I know we're a little bit over time. Let me just check here. Um, is there anything else before I think we? We covered all the ones in the chat. One just came through the Q&A window. Um, is all this very helpful information available on the DINE website or when will this webinar be available? Um, again, I'll send a follow-up email with a link to the webinar recording. It's usually available in the next day or so, so I'll be able to get that email out. Mm -hmm. um, it's okay with Grant. I usually attach a PDF of the slides so you have those available as well. Great. Yeah, and my information before we go here is on screen, uh, my phone number with my extension, and then my email. Email is probably the easiest way to reach me in and out of the office, in and out of the lab from time to time. So feel free to reach out if I didn't answer your question or if you didn't want to ask it in this kind of public space, you can certainly uh, reach out to me and I'll try my best to answer it. Uh, as always, any reports you get, if you got questions, feel free to reach out. If it's not myself, again, we have a whole slew of staff here that can help you and we'll talk you through it. We'll help you. Great. Thanks, Grant. Yeah. And thank you everyone for being here. We appreciate that. We will send you a survey in that um, email I was talking about and appreciate any feedback you will um, let us know, any future topics you'd like us to cover. That's always helpful. Our next webinar, um, which is scheduled for May 18th on periodic sprinkler testing, um, the registration link for that will be available about six to eight weeks before. And as always, watch us on the DINE website, our LinkedIn or Facebook pages, or our monthly newsletter for more information. So thank you, and we'll see you next time.